turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta-learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. Dr. Rick Hansen is a psychologist, senior fellow of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, and New York Times best-selling author. His books are available in 26 languages and include Hardwiring Happiness, Buddha's Brain, Just One Thing, and Mother Nurture. He edits the Wise Brain Bullet and has numerous audio programs. A summa cum laude graduate of UCLA and founder of the Wellspring Institute for Neuroscience and Contemplative Wisdom. He's been an invited speaker at Oxford, Stanford, and Harvard University, and taught meditation centers worldwide. If you enjoy this podcast, I would highly appreciate a review on iTunes because it helps the show grow in ways you can't even imagine. Enjoy. Rick, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Breathing. (laughs) There's actually a deep truth to that statement, just partaking of the planet i think about our lungs as such soft moist vulnerable membranes into which we are receiving literally the exhalations of trees and grasses and then we are offering our own co2 contribution to that vast cycle i mean that was the first honest answer that came up also as a meditator breathing seems pretty central Uh, i say other than that i try to spend it enjoying and contributing those feel like two fundamental things to focus on. Yeah, I love it. And in terms of the breath, you know, I've I don't remember, I don't remember who said this, but um I've heard that you know, in life, you know, if there's a kite, the the you're the you're the kite on top and then the string is the breath. Huh. In terms of regulation. So that's that's kind of funny to think about. Yeah. Rick, I, yeah, so Rick, so when I was, you know, when I was first learning about your story, um you talked about kind of the start for your own journey was college where you started to notice a difference. And I think in some respects, I think we're both quite similar in the same way. My thing was also in college when I started to become, you know, more consciously aware of how my brain processed things. So Rick, so how did you get started on, you know, what, who you are, you know, you're a neurophysiologist, you have a New York times bestselling author on happiness. How did you get started down this road? Yeah, that's a that's such a useful question, actually. Uh, the super short version, uh, and no violin music here, was that uh, I had what I'd call a C-minus childhood. It wasn't horrible, but two things happened that were really significant. One is that my parents, while being very loving and decent, were both really poor at empathy and really trying to tune into how other people felt. So. I had many little moments as a kid where the normal, even for me, an introvert, the normal amount of of being seen, being tuned into, being mirrored, uh, receiving, being in rapport with other people, for me, it was like a thin soup. It just wasn't enough. It was like trying to breathe through a straw. And the second, uh, I in school, I skipped a grade and have a very late birthday. So I was very young. I was younger than most kids going through school. And that, plus being shy and kind of dorky, led to lots of moments of rejection and so, or being dismissed or unwanted. And it also interrupted many positive moments that ideally should have occurred of being in normal ways as a kid, included, liked, befriended, and so forth. So I want to be really clear. Lots and lots of kids, lots and lots of people have much worse than I had. I'm privileged in a lot, a lot of ways. That said, little things add up over time. I'm a developmental psychologist, neuropsychologist, and a clinician. And one thing that's really clear when you listen to people's story is that little things add up over time, good or bad. And the absence of the good can be as consequential as the presence of the bad. So when I landed in college at 16, it felt like I had a huge hole in my heart. 
the normal place where we internalize supplies, because uh, that's a normal process to, of development. We take in experiences, we take in supplies in a sense. There's actually a term for that, social supplies. And based on that, we fill ourselves up. But the supplies coming to me was were really like, uh, you know, a thin soup. So what I discovered in college for myself, and now I understood, now I understand 30, 50 almost years later, almost 50 years later as a neuropsychologist, is that I discovered that if I did three things, it made all the difference in the world. One, mm -hmm. notice good facts that were relevant. So I would notice that people were friendly to me or wanted me to come over and have breakfast with them. I, I would notice a girl who smiled at me in the elevator, two girls, whoa, that was a really good day. I would notice good facts rather than just ignoring them. Second, I helped myself feel something. And uh, rather than just intellectually knowing, oh, they're nice, I felt something. That's really, really important. And by the way, these three things I'm describing here are a fundamental roadmap for shaping who you are going to become. The fundamental roadmap for um, hacking the brain and regulating and directing our own growth and development process. So in the second step, um, I let myself feel something. And then in the third step, once I recognized the good fact, felt something as a result, then I would slow down for a breath or two or three to really marinate in the experience, to register it, to register the new ideas that were coming to me, to register what it felt like to act differently with people, to register my body, how I kind of calmed down and I'd feel good when I felt liked and, I, and the war was over and I didn't have to impress anybody. I didn't have to scratch and claw my way into the inner circle. I was already there. Um, and as I did that, so as I did those three things, notice the good facts, feel something and take it in, um, any single time I did it was nice, but it didn't change everything. But the gradual accumulation, drop by drop, brick by brick, I really filled that hole in my heart. And that practice now is something I still continue to do and has taken me into the larger question of how can we actually have the experiences that are useful to us, but much more important, the first question is easy to answer. Most people are answering that question every day. The second question is the most important per question. Once we're having experiences that are useful to us, how do we gain from them? Rather than them being simply an impermanent, passing, transient, ephemeral experience. How do we help them land inside us to stick to our ribs and change us for the better bit by bit every day? And that's what I've gotten very interested in because when you know how to do that, you can help yourself every freaking day in your relationships, with your own mind, uh, in your work, your spiritual life, if that's of interest. You can help yourself every day if you know how to grow. Wow. I've never heard that before. And, you know, ever since I've been on my sort of transformative journey, yeah. I, you know, I the process that you broke down, my, I guess I just subconsciously do that. That's really interesting. And I, I guess maybe the last part, like the the one that you may not have mentioned, or maybe that's part of the marination, I like to kind of use my perspective to kind of tell myself how grateful I am, you know, and the fact that I had that experience. And in terms of the the second part, the one of letting yourself feel it, I think that's, you know, I think that's like we live, some people live their lives in a certain way and they, you know, do these patterns and patterns. And if they differentiate from that, any sort of activity, any sort of new novelty will kind of seem silly if you try to go for it. You, it kind of seems a little bit gimmicky, even though it's definitely not. Um, and I think that, so, so Rick, so how does somebody really build that in? Is that just a practice that you start off doing consciously and then over time, you, you know, your, your brain just builds it in? Yeah, the short answer is yes. The <laughs> slightly longer answer is embedded in this kind of joke in ther for therapists. How many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? Only yeah. one. But the light bulb has to want to change. So right there, we have the key to the process, which is motivation. And um, the slightly longer answer is that I think people get can be motivated to do this, to take in the good routinely, kind of in two kinds of ways. And they both work together. The first way, and both are true for me. The first way in is, is to really focus on the fact that life is often hard. And for some people, it's hard all the time. 
life is challenging. We lose people. Illnesses come. We like someone. They don't like us as much. We're in the same way. Our cats and dogs die. Strange people become elected president. Things happen. <laughs> what are we going to do, right? And um, so in the face of challenges, we need to have resources inside. There's a deep model in psychology. It's got a fancy term, the stress diathesis model. It's also in healthcare. It's this idea that our person's course through life boils down to three things, is the result of three things, challenges, vulnerabilities, and, and resources. Challenges, vulnerabilities, resources. And so if we're gonna deal with challenges that wear on our vulnerabilities, we need resources. We need to build muscles. So it's kind of like the advertising th you know, thing, what's in your wallet? Well, what's in your mind? What's in your being? What's in your heart? What do you take with you wherever you go as durable, wholesome, powerful, useful traits inside that you can draw on when the going gets tough? That's, of course, the fundamental basis of resilience. To have any, to have any kind of well-being over the long haul, you need to be resilient. And to have any kind of resilience, you need psychological resources. You need mental resources of various kinds. So one way into this for me, honestly, is a there was a real turning point. I was literally a teenager. I'm, I know I was around 15. Partly it was related to reading Dune, the classic sci-fi book by Frank Herbert, where the main character, Paul Madib, um, is in a world of trouble. It's a 15-year-old, coincidentally, my age, reading the book. And yet you can see that guy, he's constantly oriented around, he has what Carol Dweck today would call a growth mindset. He's constantly oriented around how he can train himself, including in the exotic arts of the Bene Gesserit and so on. So first point, life is challenging. We need to grow strengths inside. We need muscles. How do you get those muscles? You have experiences of what you want to grow, and then you got to turn them into a lasting change in your brain. That's mm -hmm. a headline there. The other way into this that is, helps people remember this on a regular basis, honestly, is out of a kind of kindness toward yourself. A gentleness, a sweetness, uh, a stewardship of your own life, a sense of, wow, this life is precious. It's fleeting. Uh, so many things just fly right by. Why not help myself to slow down, like you said earlier there, Mark, to take in uh, and experience what then be grateful for it, uh, to develop more and more of that attitude of gratitude or a sense of, it's like we're hungry. We're little hungry animals. Uh, okay, and you, we're surrounded by food, but we don't eat. We're emotionally hungry. We're spiritually hungry. We're socially hungry. We, we want to connect with other people. Uh, we're hungry for wisdom, for insight, for knowledge. We're hungry, and yet we don't eat. We have around us all these opportunities to experience something that's useful, valuable, beautiful, enjoyable, delightful, and we don't swallow. We don't chew and swallow. We just blow right through the experience before we get on to the next one. And that's very poignant and leads to a lot of unnecessary suffering. So for me, those two things are both motivating as opportunities for people and they work together. And, and then what happens to finish here, what happens is it becomes a habit. What I tell people is <clears throat> see if you can do three things every day and they're really simple and they'll take less than five minutes. One is as you go through your day, half a dozen times a day for a breath or two or more, slow down and let the moment land. Let yeah. the sense of relaxation land. Let the sense of fortitude and grit land. Let love land. Let pleasure land. Let gratitude land. If you have an insight, new way of understanding others, new way of understanding your own mind, let it land. Half a dozen times a day. And look for opportunities to do that. And that will change your whole day. Second, think of the one thing you really want to grow these days inside yourself. Okay, you can have two. But basically, what are the key mental resources that will really help you these days to deal with the, whatever it is, the challenge you're dealing with or the vulnerability? Maybe you got a tough condition outside yourself, like a roommate who's driving you crazy or a partner, a romantic partner who's not interested in you or is a nutcase or, you know what I mean, whatever. Your parents want to come live with you. I don't know. Uh, whatever the challenge might be. Or the challenge is inside yourself. Maybe you're anxious about stuff or you have self-doubt. You're not confident. It's Or you're, it's scary for you to speak up in public or assert yourself at work, whatever it might be. What if it were in your mind more of these days would really help? So know the one thing you're trying to grow these days. What are you focused on? What are you trying to develop? 
you know what that is and then look for once you know what it is look for experiences of it and then when you come upon them slow down to help them sink into your brain once or more a day and then the last thing i call it reset to green which is to come back to the natural resting state of the nervous system uh, based on the three-stage evolution of the brain the inner lizard mouse and monkey the reptilian brainstem mammalian subcortex primate human neocortex lizard mouse and monkey relates to our needs for safety satisfaction and connection that's a lot of material in one kind of two sentences there but the essence of it all is help yourself once a day reset to green where you tune into a felt sense of an enoughness of safety an enoughness of satisfaction and enoughness of connection so that in the moment at least there's a sense of fullness and balance rather than the typical sense of deficit and disturbance, something missing, something wrong, that is the underlying engine of mild to moderate chronic stress that so many people these days live in. So if you reset to green again and again, in which there's a sufficiency of needs met, then stress falls away because stress is the result of feeling needs unmet. So if you marinate in that experience, again, for half a minute or a minute or more, each day you reset to green, increasingly you build up what I call an unshakable core, an unshakable core of resilient well-being. That's my, what my next book's about, resilient well-being. So when you meet the next moment, you're already strong. You're already full. You already are rested in a fundamental sense of well-being and capability as you meet the next challenges. And that changes everything. And you can really, really train that in your nervous system over time by doing this thing I'm saying here, uh, reset to green. All right. Yeah. Thanks, man. That's a mouthful. I hope it's okay. <laughs> that was, that was awesome. You, so much stuff sparked in my head. Um, one of my favorite philosophers, Jason Silva, he talks about the, the neocortex, our neocortical hardware. And he says that, you know, by using our imagination, it's allowed us to to build the modern world, to to yeah. build all these crazy technological things that are saving all sorts of people's lives and developing infrastructure. And then he says at the same time, it's kind of, you know, now that we've secured the future and built it, now it tries to find out ways of how that might go wrong. And he says that, you know, the modern human is just now, you know, despite the fact that we're living in the safest time ever in recorded human history, the 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 average modern man is afflicted by a quasi permanent state of anxiety and he 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 says that a good way to to get out of this for for a time being is to kind of like what you said to submit in the moment and i think that's called uh, a state of flow um mm. to right um yeah. where i think i think i think you should you definitely know more about this but i believe that part of your brain goes quiet and you enter in this weird space where time, you know, your perception of time is now completely skewed. Do you, do you know anything about flow and can you speak? Oh to yeah. I, I'm super interested into that. Oh, great. Well, um, this is great talking with you, Mark. So yeah. I'd say two things here, right? Um, <clears throat> the, the one thing I'd like to say briefly is it's really interesting that as, and many people have observed this as well, Humans today are extraordinarily uh, capable at intervening in their external environment. We can do all kinds of stuff, amazing stuff. But humans, unfortunately, most people are not very skillful with their inner world. They're not very in charge of it, and they're not able to shape it gradually over time. They're fundamentally, you could put it kind of simply in two ways. They're not able to regulate where their mind dwells and they're not able to regulate how they shape their mind based on where it dwells. So you just think about getting more skillful, competent, capable with where does your attention dwell? Where does your mind rest? And what do you do with what it rests upon? And so for me, it's very useful to learn how to do that, how to regulate where your attention rests, where do you dwell? What's your fundamental mood? What are you paying attention to? And then second, how are you learning? How are you healing and growing from where what you're experiencing? And um, that is an incredibly important thing to become more skillful about at, right? Because it's the skill of skills. It's the skill that produces the other skills. If 
gratitude, yeah. grit, compassion, confidence, or superpowers, the skill of learning is the superpower of superpowers because it grows the rest of them. So to me, that's point one. And then point two on your stuff about flow, that's super cool. So here's here's like a quick little bit of useful neuroscience, right? Um, you're exactly right. In the last three, several million years, the brain has tripled in volume. And there have probably been two major uh, drivers of that and also benefits of it that go together in evolution. One driver is love, broadly defined. The so-called social brain uh, evolved a lot because of the uh, you know, the reproductive advantages, as it were, genes passing on genes, of improving social skills, language, cooperative planning, empathy, bonding, altruism, gossip, politics, the important things. So we got better at that, and getting better at that helped our ancestors survive, and then that helped the brain get even better at that. All right. The other thing that developed were these networks in the midline of the cortex that enable what people call mental time travel or as I call it, the simulator. We're able to reflect on the past and we're able to imagine different futures, different scenarios, and then choose among them. Italian tonight for dinner or Chinese? I don't know, what would I feel like? Talk to my boss this way or mm, talk to my boss that way, which is likely to go better. That's a fantastic evolutionary advantage. Even our nearest relatives, bonobos and chimpanzees, are trapped in the present moment. They're not able to reflect on the past deliberately or to imagine different scenarios very skillfully for the future. So it's a phenomenal evolutionary advantage. Unfortunately, it enables us to regret the past, to obsess about woulda, coulda, shoulda, uh, to replay interactions with other people again and again, to, to return again and again to our grievances and grudges with other people. And this capacity for mental time travel in the simulator enables us to imagine all kinds of little mini movies about what could go wrong, anxious preoccupations of various kinds, uh, anticipatory punishment if we dare to speak up and stand up, for example. Or just more generally, the simulator, especially trained by modern media, uh, it, it mm -hmm. takes us out of the present moment into these kind of make-believe worlds that are like cotton candy. They're momentarily kind of pleasurable, but they don't have much substance to them. So we remain hungry, and yet we seek to satisfy our appetites with more cotton candy, which doesn't really make us uh, satisfied or nourished in a deep way. So that's, uh, for me, I, I like modern life. I like ibuprofen. I like ESPN. I like refrigerators. I like good beer. I like, you know, good coffee. Like I like being able to talk with you right now, Mark. That's pretty good stuff. But meanwhile, uh, we have the responsibility to take charge of this extraordinary piece of equipment, the nervous system headquartered in the brain that we were endowed with through evolution. So how to do it, this flow thing, it's really cool. So technically uh, there's a place for being able to use these midline cortical networks, the front of which is more uh, task oriented, specific planning oriented, and the rear is more where we default when we just kind of space out but they're both a place where we go where there's a lot of sense of I, me, myself, and I, and a lot of uh, involvement with the past and the future. Not much present moment, peaceful, selfless awareness. On the other hand, there are these networks on the sides of your brain, especially on the right side for right-handed people or the left side for left-handed people because for right-handed people and a lot of left-handed people, the right hemisphere is specialized for gestalt processing holistic global processing, the whole picture. Left hemisphere specialized for sequential processing, thus language on the left hemisphere because language is sequential. So the point is, when you come into the present moment and you re relax the sense of self, you take things less personally, you're just here, you're just now, you're kind of in the immediacy of your experience. Maybe you're in the immediacy of washing a dish or right now in the immediacy of being with you. Even if you're still also engaging language and some planning of various kinds, to the extent that a person can really drop into a kind of accepting present moment awareness, they tend to engage these lateral networks which decrease activation in the midline. It's like a seesaw. As one goes up, it pushes the other one down. And when you're dropped into that lateral mode of network activation, you're much more peaceful. You're in the present. You're not 
unskillfully preoccupied with either the past or the future. And research shows, and there are MRI studies about this, that if you train in mindfulness, you strengthen these neural networks on the right side. Because technically, as you know, the saying, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. So if you stimulate the neural substrates of a beneficial, useful, wholesome state of being, such as present moment awareness, if you stimulate the neural networks that are the basis of that way of being, you strengthen them. And so they are more powerful when you pull them online, and they tend to activate more and more naturally and automatically. So that increasingly, to finish, you can be grounded, as, as I've trained myself in this way, and other people have too, uh, where you're really in the present. And that's where inner peace really lives. That's where joy lives. It's always in the present. Uh, you're able to reflect on the past or imagine the future skillfully, and then when you've gotten all the value, boom, boom, you come back to the now. And uh, a, a trick to hack your brain, I'll tell you really fast, to lateral networks, try to get a sense of breathing as, as your body as a whole. In other words, normally when we're aware of the sensations of breathing, to come back to where we started, our attention skitters from point to point, around the upper lip, in the chest, in the nose, you know, the belly, blah, blah. If you just kind of widen the spotlight of attention to include the sense of breathing in your whole chest, and then increasingly widening out, you have a sense of your whole body as you breathe. The whole body known at once as a single unified percept. We can all do it. Some people are probably better at it than others to start, like people who use their bodies for dancing or live in nature a lot, because that tends to take you out into a sense of the whole. Uh, but with a little practice, you can get a sense of just abiding as a whole body breathing, which naturally stimulates these lateral networks and very rapidly de-stresses you. There you are in a business meeting, you know, everybody's rattling on, you know, and you're just, doo -doo, bam, cool. <laughs> you know, whole body breathing, paying attention, contributing as needed, and no, no drama, no suffering, no problem. Whole body breathing. Okay, what do you think about all that? Wow. Man, I'm really glad you're on this podcast. Well, I cool. am, I yeah, I am. I'm super interested about human attention and flow. Recently, I noticed that whenever I filmed the podcast and I talked with somebody and I learned a lot, I would just, I would go into a state of flow and I'd come out. I'd be like, "Wait, what just happened?" And I actually, I ended up starting a like a mini series on this podcast called Flow where I try to get into flow about a particular idea or a thought process. And, you know, the, the reason why I think flow is, is really interesting to me is because I remember before in my life, before, you know, I was kind of aware of this stuff, my, I don't know where my attention was, you know, I, and I think attention is a prerequisite for all of this inner transformation. Yeah. Um, you know, and I remember, um, you know, I, I kind of won, you know, I, I started meditating, started eating healthy, do, you know, started doing all, all the, all the great things. I had noticed that my attention, you know, for the first time, I actually had control of it. Huh. It was, it was this weird process. And like, I could feel my body on this planet and my breath. And from that point on all the, the changes, all of that stuff, it was all very easy. I think it was just yeah. leading up to that point. Um, you know, which is why I think that physiological changes, physical changes that you can do, like eating healthy and doing meditative practices, are a good way to kind of jumpstart that, right? Would Would you say so? Oh yeah, I think um, we can influence ourselves through different pathways. Uh, certainly, one great way to influence ourselves is through the body, and whether it's drinking some coffee, which I'm doing today to kind of stay alert because I've got a little bit of a cold or uh, deliberately as you breathe, extending the exhalation, which will naturally slow the heart rate because the parasympathetic wing of the nervous system regulates exhaling. And as it gets engaged, it puts kind of what's called a break on the speed of the heart uh, beating. So it slows the heart rate, which is naturally calming and soothing and lowers stress, which helps strengthen the immune system. So in effect, you can deliberately hack your, and, and meanwhile, suddenly you feel more relaxed and peaceful and centered. 
So you you can really hack your consciousness by literally over 10 seconds, exhaling more lengthily than you normally do. And you just feel immediately more mellow and centered. So those are kind of, those are physical interventions. Flip the other way, you can bring to mind something that makes you feel happy or inspired or strong or cared about or loved. And that's going to influence you the other way. And so you're really right. Both of those pathways work. But to your point, you're hundred percent right. Our attention is like a vacuum cleaner. It is the front end of who we are becoming. And what we rest our attention on is illuminated and then it's sucked into us. So if you have any, if a person has any interest in autonomy, like I'm a stubborn independent person, uh, if a person has any interest in autonomy or any interest in um, getting skillful at shaping who they are becoming, it's absolutely fundamental to do just what you said, which is to become attentive to attention, become aware of what your awareness is doing and get more control over it. Uh, it's interesting, the godfather of American psychology, William James, over a hundred years ago said, the education of attention would be the education par excellence. Hmm. That's cool, huh? That's that's terrific. I 100% agree. Um, yeah, wow, that's that's really interesting, Rick. In terms of you know, I so when I was looking you up and I listened to your podcast, you're you're very much well rounded. You have a good grasp of all sorts of different um, subjects that I think make you become a really really impactful and efficient um, human helper. Um, how does, you know, how does your experience with spirituality kind of relate to this? Oh, thank you. Um, well, I, I, first on being a human helper, uh, I try, right. That's the important thing. And, and second, it's interesting. Uh, I think what's really important for people to appreciate is that, um, the good we want to grow inside ourselves begins with an experience of it. And when I landed in college, I felt I was numb from the neck down. I was totally in my head. I was like Spock without a human mother, you know, in Star Trek and uh, pure Vulcan. And what I had to really learn was that what we want to grow inside ourselves must be experienced. We must have experiences in our body of relaxing, or feeling strong. We, we must feel in our heart and in our emotions, cared about and of worth and value, for example. We have to start with experience. And one of the big um, lessons for me about that in terms of how I became you know, a helper and spirituality is truly in here, is I created this online experiential program. I didn't think much about when I did it. It's called the Foundations of Wellbeing. Now I think almost 13,000 people have done it. Uh, it's had huge impact on people. And the thing that makes it really special and distinctive is that it's experiential. It's not a talking head rattling at you. It's really about lots of short little experiential things you can do that leave lasting residues behind that are really good, hardwired into your nervous system. And so for me along the way, when I look back, including about experiences of spirituality, I, I think how important it is to focus on the experiential, whether it's in the flow of everyday life or whether you're doing something more formal, like doing a meditation retreat or talking to a coach, let's say, or doing something online, like you know my Foundations of Wellbeing program, experiential is really fundamental. And then with regard to spirituality, people use that word different in different ways. So I just think it's important to be careful about that word. And I've been around the block. I started meditating in 1974. I was there at the front end of the human potential movement. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff. I've done a lot of crazy stuff. And I've also gotten trained in kind of the straight world of rah, 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 classic psychoanalytically grounded, you know, clinical therapy stuff. So I've seen a lot of stuff. And I reserve the word spirituality for that which is transcendental, that which is by definition meaningfully distinct from the natural frame. And so, for example, if someone goes into a forest and says, well, this is my church, I go, man, that's great. Now, in the forest, the experience you're having 
in your own mind, do you think God is involved in some way with the experience you're having? And I'm using the word God very loosely. And some people will say, well, really, no, I just fundamentally, if you think about it, it's a natural phenomenon. It's a wonderful, beautiful, important, extraordinary experience. I'm not trying to take away from the experience. But at bottom, people conceive of that experience as a result of natural forces, natural processes, an animal in a peaceful setting, at ease, opening, calming, beautiful and natural. I don't use the word spiritual for that because I reserve that word for that which is transcendental. Now, some people are convinced there is nothing more than the natural frame, which includes a lot of exotic stuff, quarks, quantum entanglement, dark energy, wild stuff. You know, here we are in a mediocre little planet around a mediocre star and a mediocre galaxy amidst two trillion other galaxies. Yeah. <laughs> well, it all bubbled into being 13 plus billion years ago. That's pretty crazy right there, but that's not necessarily God. I mean, so for me, when I think of the transcendental, I think of uh, minimally uh, unconditionality, that which is the unconditioned, the Buddha spoke about this, that which is a field of fertile possibility, always just prior to conditioned actuality eternally. There's a lot baked into that sentence. So yeah. that's one way of thinking about um, the transcendental because in the natural, by definition, it's conditioned, it's determined. Whatever is the case right now and now and now is the result of natural causes that preceded it. Mm. You, you don't need God to explain a chain of dominoes falling, right? And so uh, to think of something that is meaningfully distinct from the natural, for me, it has to do with the field of possibility. So unconditioned, the deathless, that which doesn't change. That's the first kind of characteristic or attribute classically of a potential transcendental. And I have a very strong sense of that. And I've cultivated a sense of that. Um, and then, of course, there's the question of, is the transcendental conscious? Yeah. Mm. And then also is the transcendental benevolent, loving in some meaningful sense. And notice that I'm not necessarily presuming a kind of classic Abrahamic personality, you know, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, maybe. And I think people have different ways of relating to this, these possibilities. And I, as a scientifically grounded person um, and someone who operates in secular frameworks most of the time, I'm perfectly comfortable with atheism, uh, in, even dogmatic atheism, although I must say, I, don't, I think dogmatic atheism is not fundamentally scientific in its attitude because it presumes a foreclosure of possibilities um, and so forth. But um, on the other hand, I think for those who care about this, uh, one of the reasons to practice in the natural frame and literally change your material body along the way, especially its, its brain, uh, one motivation for doing that uh, to put it metaphorically, is to clear the crud off of the stained glass windows of the mind so the light that was always already there can shine through more brightly. Hmm. That's uh, I love that. And Rick, you don't have to answer this question. I'm just interested. Have you heard of experience, the term spiritual, mystical, transcendental experience? You know, I maybe read about this phenomenon about a year ago. And it's all these sorts of different, you know, in history, these mystics, these monks talk oh, yeah. about this, this experience that they underwent that is ineffable that, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think anybody really understands it. Maybe you do. Uh, I'm not too sure. Mm -hmm. um, but where the, the, you're kind of in this transcendental state um, yeah. and it, it's metaphysical. It's, it's beyond us. Right. Have you had a, a, an experience like this? Uh, I'm too old to beat around the bush. You know, it's good. Uh, well, let's see. So um, I would, s there are different versions. You know, um, William James, speaking of, he wrote a book called The Varieties of Religious Experience. So there are many different kinds of these sort of experiences. And then people who are scholars in this area, and I'm not, have tried to sort them and think about them and look for common qualities and what seem like different, very different experiences, blah, 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 blah. Um, so for myself, I've 
the kind of profound experience people talk about where they feel ecstatically lived by something that is divine. I have not had that kind of awakening. Uh, on the other hand, I've cultivated a very clear sense of kind of abiding as everything locally. Hmm. Like whatever's true here locally is a momentary local patterning in the fabric of reality that's the result of a vast network of causes. And so one can have a sense that whatever is happening in your own mind right now, in your, in, in your body and so forth, is a local expression of a vast whole. So, so uh, there can be more and more of a relaxed sense of the apparent boundaries between the body and the rest of the world or the mind and other and the rest of reality. All right. And like right now, I, I definitely have a pretty clear sense of um, the field of possibility that's always just prior to that. And so that, to go to a sink from Tibet, I think speaks to what they say, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening. I think there's an ongoing process of that that's really possible for us. And um, they also have a saying, moments of awakening many times a day. So I think to finish here, there are different things a person can kind of focus on. I mean, for me, the process of recognizing that factually this body in this moment this mind in this moment are a local patterning of one fabric of reality and there are different patternings a mosquito going by is a different patterning the sun the milky way galaxy is a different patterning uh interactions between people or a certain kind of patterning. There are all these patternings of the one fabric. And being able to open out into a sense of that and inc abide increasingly at peace as that, that's been for me a very meaningful part of my journey. And in all that, what happens is we feel more and more lived by love, lived by love. And that's that's been my own path a lot. Uh, and to become more accessible to the divine, more accessible to the transcendental. That's been meaningful to me. Uh, and I want to be really clear. I'm not trying to persuade anybody, and I'm not trying to speak as a professional uh, religious person. I'm just a psychologist. I'm a guy. Uh, now, I know that other people, their path tends to be more passionate. Uh, in Hinduism, they talk about it as bhakti, more devotional. Uh, more ecstatic, and I think people are just drawn to different ways. But mm -hmm. to finish here, perhaps, the ultimate question for me is that at the end of the day, um, are you interested in the divine or not? Do you conceive of what you're doing in wonderful ways? Like when I'm a therapist, I don't conceive of what I'm doing with people as shaped by God in any way. God is not a factor. No heresy here or disrespect in when I'm helping someone figure out how to raise their really bright, but totally impulsive bouncing off the walls, 13 year old. Someone I talked with yesterday. So, you know, I'm comfortable operating in that way. You know what I mean? On the other hand, I think the great matter is to paraphrase a certain thing. I'll, I'll better finish on this point. Um, it's been said that either humans are the only intelligent life in the universe, or we could break it more locally. We could say either we're the only intelligent life in the Milky Way galaxy, or there's another intelligent species out there. Either possibility is extraordinary. Either we're alone or we have company as intelligent, civilized life. Uh, either one is incredible. So for me, either there is a transcendental or there isn't. And either possibility is extraordinary. And I think it's very useful to draw a sharp distinction between those two possibilities and then not muddy that distinction with a lot of new age blather that finds spirituality everywhere. I'm like, well, 
if spirituality is everywhere, it's nowhere because it's not a meaningful distinction. Okay. What do you think about all that? That was fantastic. And um, Dr. Rick Hansen, thank you for coming on the show. Where can our listeners reach out to you and you know check out your work? I'm a psychologist. I'm a practical guy. Most of what I do is really practical. Uh, you asked me a personal question. I tried to answer yeah. it. Um, so people should go to my website, Rick Hansen, H-A-N-S-O-N.net. That's the key, rickhanson.net. And there you'll find a ton of freely offered resources. You're very welcome to take them, use them, share them with others, do it with them, whatever you like, use them in your work, use them for yourself personally, use them as a parent. And I have tons of things there. And a lot of what I do is now these online experiential programs like the Foundations of Wellbeing that are really structured, they're inexpensive. We offer scholarships for people in financial need. And um, it's a wonderful way to do what could be called self-directed neuroplasticity, taking charge of where you dwell and what you have inside you that you can take with you wherever you go. Yeah, that will all be down below in the show notes for those of you listening. And uh, Dr. Rick Hansen, you know, this show is called Humans 2.0 and I think you're uh, you're an exceptional human 2.0. I think you go above and beyond in helping people with your wide variety of expertise in different topics that can kind of, you know, create this bridge for people that, you know, we need more people like you in this mm -hmm. world. Final Thank question. You, well, back at you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Final question. Do you have a self inquisitive question to ask the audience and maybe they can, you know, keep that question in mind for the, the rest of the day or however long they remember it. Yeah. Very simple. What would be good today to take into yourself? Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This has been your host, Mark Metry. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.